late spring, and Course 44 are flying their fastest aircraft, the 1,500-mile-an-hour Lightning. This morning, it is the turn Jim Ludford on the right, his tutor, Tim Apple. The main thing is don't relax at the end of the trip because we've finished doing the exercise. Remember, there's a fairly short runway and the landing is absolutely critical. And we must be down with 5,000 feet to go and do a precautionary landing from the word go. So if the chute comes off, we'll be able to stop in the runway length available. Okay, see the other side. Tim warns Jim because the main runway at Boscombe is being relayed. And the alternative is slightly shorter than the minimum recommended for the lightning. The Lightning, for all its complexity, lacks modern electronic flight control systems which are essential to fly today's fighters. Students flying the Lightning can therefore experience at first hand the effects of high-speed flight. The two Rolls-Royce Avon engines develop more power than a whole squadron of wartime bombers. Jim Ludford, Harrier pilot, is introduced to an alternative form of vertical takeoff. This exercise allows students to experience the effects of transonic flight, going through the sound barrier, if you like, without having a computer between them and the aircraft. Level at 40,000 feet. The Lightning, still one of the fastest fighters in RAF service, is delightful to fly and very popular with the students. It's, uh, it's nice to fly an airplane with so much thrust. Reheat produce enough extra thrust to accelerate the Lightning to 1,400 miles an hour, Mach 1.8, but at the cost of very restricted range. That is by far the best airplane here. Uh, unfortunately, we don't fly it as much as we'd like to. We certainly, we've got, I've had a couple of trips, I think most of us have now, and that was tremendous uh, excitement, actually. Dated as the Lightning may be, the RAF still has two operational squadrons. It's like a Mirage with two engines. Because there is only one, flights on the Lightning are rationed. Well, it's a bit like the forbidden fruit. You get shown a brief glimpse of it, and then it's taken <laughs> away from you. Uh, I've flown 35 minutes in it. It was great fun, but uh, I'd like a little bit more. It was good fun. He, uh the type of thing that you uh, look forward to. But not the landing. The lightning is known to the RAF as the frightening. The landing is the most critical moment. Jim Ludford makes perfect touchdown and taxis in after the fastest flight he has ever made. It's a delightful machine. It's, uh, it's a pilot's aeroplane. Just uh, like a good car ought to be. It's not that big and it's got a great big motor in it, or two great big motors. Although the Lightning is a difficult aircraft to maintain, being non-standard, they hope to keep this one airworthy for some years yet. Okay, Jim? Good. Yes, yeah, it was working well, wasn't it? But... I think you saw the rate of climb. Supersonic was down a bit on what it was, subsonic. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, we got to 37,000 feet at 1.35 instead of 0.9. Still going. So, and going well in the climb. So it looks like it works well. Landing was nice, wasn't it? Oh, I should say so. Right, right. Jim now has to write a report on his high-speed flight. Bob Horton is on the helicopter course. He is preparing for an exercise with JT from Singapore. They are working as a two-man syndicate. The Lynx is fitted with an electronic navigation system, uh, which, like a home computer, has to be programmed. Okay. 
The position of the waypoints, or geographical locations of targets, have been entered into the computer's memory. Now what I'm looking for is a woods up on the nose, which I can actually see already, a finger-shaped wood, just to the left of the nose. And you see the little uh, thing there, it's telling me there's the woods there. <coughs> okay, this is how we would normally wait now in ambush until the tanks actually come out onto the killing ground that's already been selected. As soon as they're visual, tell the aimer, who's JT in this particular case, to select whichever weapons he wants and then go for them. But now I've seen that, so I now set waypoint three, three, which is the next one I want to go for. And the bar's telling me go that way. He should be turning it now. Yeah. So round we come now. As you can see, it's pretty featureless sort of terrain as well that we're going into. Yeah. This is the killing ground just coming into the area now where we were actually going to go and take all the tanks out. JT and Bob okay, are to assume that the equipment is new, right. untried, and that they are to see if it is suitable for squadron use. Okay, I've still got to get away point six. I've shot all these tanks. The equipment is immune from enemy jamming. Accurate navigation at low level in battle means the helicopter spends the minimum time in forward areas and so is less vulnerable. This Jaguar II is about to be flown on a low level exercise, but at 500 miles an hour. It is being flown to test the HUD, head up display, with a related navigation system similar to the one fitted to the Lynx. The student is the Australian, Nick Coulson, a member of B Syndicate. It's going to be very different from the flying he's used to. Yeah, it is. So I've done a lot of low-level flying in fast jets now. And of course it's strange country. Yeah, well that's what I'm uh, wondering about. Normally in Australia you can see things from miles away, so I'm not too sure what I'm going to find. Right, Nick. Uh, the tutor, one, James Giles. Very different from anything you've been doing before, right? And I know you're not familiar with the environment. Therefore, the way we'll play it is that I will do a lot of the flying for you. Okay, I'll actually fly the airplane to let you operate the system. So you're happy with the switches, you're happy with what the, what the system is actually doing for you. Yep. So what we'll do, when we go over each waypoint, we'll actually do a planned fix. So from here, for example... Um, All three members of the syndicate will fly with the tutor before they fly the exercise solo. And the, the sequence goes, plan fix, when you're actually overhead, I will note down in the back the time and the bearing and range. Yep. Then it's then I'll call you to deselect it. Okay. Okay, you happy with that? Yeah, no, no, I'm not. Do we I select I hit plan fix. Yes. Do I have to leave it there while you do that? Yes, or you do. Can I hit change desk straight away. No, you have to leave it there. Okay. You can change uh, yes, leave it there. Okay, fine. Okay. Now I'd like you to stay low level in that. Um, I know it's unfamiliar territory, but mm -hmm. I'd like you to try to get a feel for the workload throughout all these things. I'll be monitoring you from the back, so there's no need to worry about uh, okay. actual terrain avoidance. So try to go for 250 feet. Um, yep. If you're more comfortable, obviously, four or 500 feet, that's fine. But try to go for it. Try to keep the speed up mm -hmm. 400 knots plus. Mm -hmm. OK. What, what I want to just point out here is the, uh, the waypoints we're going to. At least you've seen them then when we're going to. The lake's here, and that's the, the close-up map. The one we're actually going for, the dam, is that point there. There is a small lake just to the south of it, but that's the main lake for the main dam. Okay, so that's actually waypoint five. The other waypoints all have vertical extent. The chimney which stands out very well on the side of the hill, and that's the approach direction. So that is a tricky one. Alstar, you know, is on the ridge from the top of the hill. So those are the waypoints we're going to be going for. This is the Jaguar. Okay. I always recognize the Okay, you want to get up, I'll just go to the back seat. Nick Coulson has spent most of his time flying heavy transport aircraft. The Jaguar will be a new experience for him. Before every flight, the pilot in command makes a careful visual inspection of his aircraft. This sortie will be at minimum height. 250 feet at 500 miles an hour. There is little margin for error.
As the Jaguar lifts off the Boscombe Down runway, Nick switches on the head-up display to test it. The electronic navigation system is directing them to the first waypoint, a folly known as Alf's Tower. Right on track, even though the Jaguar is flying very low and very fast. On to the next waypoint, the lakes. The moving map in the cockpit shows that the lakes with the dam should lie dead ahead. The first lake, and the dam. Zero error at this waypoint. The head-up display shows the speed, around 450 knots. Nick resets the system for the next waypoint. The track will take them past Glastonbury Tor. Finally, the system guides the Jaguar back to Boscombe Down for landing and the debrief. In the humid atmosphere, water vapor streams from the Jaguar's wingtips. Right, excellent. Good, Nick. two things. Firstly, I got all the data for the alignment, and that was good. You saw that rapid align after normal. Yes, that's yep. right. As far as the accuracy goes, as you can see, absolutely super. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's unusual, but uh, yeah. but certainly for the for the inertial systems around here. Because we did that rapid align. Exactly, rapid align half a mile after 50 minutes. Yeah. So super. And as you saw, the regress saw 35 minutes, 400 yards. Mm. So that really is a sort of accuracy that mm. could take you to a target. Yeah. What do you think of it? Well, it, it uh, wasn't too much different than what uh, we'd expected, but yeah. uh, you, obviously the NCU yes. is uh, a bit of a pain. And That's looking the down control there, unit. yeah, right. <coughs> and looking down there uh, is not not very good news. Um, what do you mean by not very good news? I mean, well, obviously I... you're looking into the cockpit when you're yes. at low level, uh, reasonably fast. Okay, Nick, are you happy to go solo with that? Um, yeah, should right. you? Bear I mean, in mind. <laughs> Bear in mind, there's a guy in the back, okay? Use yeah. him to take data. Yeah. Use him to look at. There are two of you, as I briefed. Make sure he's helping you look at. Yep. All right? Yep. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, James. The American Navy student, Tom Cusser. What we're going to do now is do the first part of the assessment of the test to determine the minimum control speed of the aircraft under asymmetric power. The aircraft is a turboprop Andover. And you will be re increasing the rudder angle to keep the aircraft straight, looking for the rudder deflection and the rudder force. What we're looking for is when we get to 150 pounds foot force, when we've reached that, still wings level, and we are losing directional control of the aircraft, you may then apply five degrees of bank towards the live engine. So we'll slow down to six shaker uh, in the configuration we want, which is 22 and a half flap wheels up. Apply full power with water meth, and then as it passes 102 knots, I will auto feather the uh, number one engine. Then I want you to assess the handling requirements the control forces you have to make, the control inputs, to keep the aircraft under control. Are you okay, happy? I'm happy. So, if you're ready, I'll select the port engine auto feather facility on. Slow down now to the stick shaker. Approaching, should be, there it is. Okay, full power going on. Okay, we're climbing and accelerating. Stand by. Mark for 102 knots. Okay, failing the engine. Left swing. Control supplied. Right rudder. Stick forward, 102. Right either on. Full right either on. Five degrees into the good engine. Climbing. Okay. Right. And the 150 pounds force. Okay, it's down to 150 pounds. Force. Okay. Right. Okay, so was it controllable at 102 knots? It in was your controllable. Opinion? 
Uh, we only got about 25 degrees uh, heading change and did not lose any altitude. We required initially a full right rudder and we backed it off after we got the angle bank into control. Okay, we will now uh, pull the engines back again and relight that. Uh, okay. Right, you ready? Okay, I'm set. Okay, right, off we go. It's rotating. This exercise is to discover how the Andover would behave if an engine failed on takeoff. Tom Coltzer, like the other students, is now being trained to undertake difficult and at times exciting testing. Well, every day actually is, is an exciting day, you know. Especially in the beginning when you have to fly a different aircraft, you know, and it changes very quick. You fly in within 14 days six different aircraft. The most exciting happening I had was my first solo on the Andover. I had two conversion rides before, and the third flight was the solo one. And I got hit by a lightning strike. <laughs> the Peter Boom fell off, and there was a big, you know, big light. Must have felt like, you know, several years ago in the Battle of Britain. <laughs> the second term of the year's course begins with a new aircraft joining the school fleet, a BAC 111 a second-hand airliner from Air Pacific, which had been strengthened for operations from rough island airstrips. Come in, Marco. The Italian student, Mirko Zuliani, is to fly the airliner. Right. Ron Rhodes, the fixed-wing qualified flying instructor. I want you to do all the checks. You to behave as captain. OK. Um, so... I didn't do the start yesterday. That's right. We um, well, that, that's easy enough. Okay. And you'll find that we help. You know, we're asking you to be captain. <laughs> okay. We're still helping you. We'll go to flight level two, four, five today. <clears throat> we tried this yesterday. We haven't done this exercise very many times yet. Haven't had the aeroplane long enough. I want you to take over the aeroplane before you get to 0.75 mark. It uh, accelerates ra really rather nicely. And I want you to see how fast it can go. Um, so we'll do the normal start and uh, we'll do a standard takeoff. Between Mirko has had one short flight in the 111 which is by far the largest aircraft he, a fighter pilot, has yet flown. His task is to make an emergency dive from 37,000 feet to 10,000 feet. It is what would have to be done if the cabin pressure failed. The dive will be steep as the pilots reach for the safe oxygen level of 10,000 feet. A flight engineer joins the crew, making the surprisingly small flight deck very crowded. The Boscombe Down Tower slots this flight in with the scores of others from this busy airfield. Clear takeoff at the five Rotate. And V2. Mirko, though unfamiliar with the big airliner, makes a perfect takeoff. And the 111 climbs on autopilot. And it goes up to the flight turn. And it maps are off. And The 111, like all aircraft with high-mounted tails, can get into a stall from which recovery is impossible. So this first part of the exercise is vital. You have control. I have a control. Climb to hold, keep no, it 150. Hold OK. We do a stick pusher descent. Okay. Speed's about the same. Okay, closing the throttle, then. Maneuver that would have shaken the martinis in a holiday jet. What we would now do is set ourselves up for Mirko recovers the aircraft and climbs back for the pressurization failure dive. Practice max rate descent, go. As the 111 dived at the maximum permissible rate, any passengers not strapped in would have experienced weightlessness. Because the air pressure has failed, the flight crew have to put on oxygen masks. I have control of the airplane. To avoid overstressing this civil aircraft, one has to be careful pulling out of the dive. All right, mask off, back to normal. Send you solo on that, Marco. 
As the course progresses, the students will fly the school's fleet on more and more demanding exercises. But the ability to fly competently is only part of the tutor's expectations. We are looking for much more than a simple ability to fly an airplane. That has to be there. The, the pilot has to be above average, if you like, has to have the, the affinity in an aircraft that he can relax in it, that he can almost, it becomes second nature to him what he's actually doing with the aircraft or what the aircraft is doing. So airmanship has to be an inbuilt, uh, inbuilt into, the, into the pilot or into the test pilot. On top of that, what we're now looking for is a man who can put himself beyond what he's actually doing with the aircraft and look at what it in itself is doing, how he's interacting with it, how it's enabling him uh, to do the job he wants to do with it, how it's making it easy or difficult in, in whatever fashion. So rather than blaming himself when the aircraft isn't going well, now we want a man to take himself out of that situation and look at why the aircraft isn't letting him uh, reach the performance levels that he wants to reach. The helicopter students also have to attain high performance standards, flying above, below and beyond normal squadron limits. The tutors never use the word dangerous, but the next exercise would qualify if they did. It has a rather sinister name, the avoid curve. It's an area of the aircraft's flight envelope which the pilot must avoid staying in continuously if on the circumstances of him suffering a sudden engine failure, he's going to manage to land the aircraft safely. And it's usually defined by a height and an airspeed combination. If the pilot should have an engine failure within those areas, the chances of him getting away with a safe landing are pretty remote. As this American test pilot was to discover. This film is shown to the helicopter students as part of their avoid curve lecture. It certainly makes their tutor's words seem inadequate. It is a critical area. It's an area which you will not have flown before, an avoid curve. You will, as throughout your training, throughout your operational flying, have carried out engine off landings, at least at some stage, but you will never have looked at landings on the edges of the avoid curve, and you will certainly not have tested are some of the more critical areas of the avoid curve. Remember, at all heights below 200 feet, coordinate the throttle closing and the lever lowering carefully. Make sure on touchdown there's no side drift, skids are level, and the minimum ground speed, as I said, five knots. Any questions so far? Right, well, Ian, uh, tell me in the past when you've done this, what sort of problems have you found when you've been trying to close the throttle and lower the lever at the same time? Good point, that, Bob. Uh, as, as you know, the, you do require quite a handful of throttle to get it fully closed on the scout. What you have got to avoid is while you're doing that and coordinating with lever lowering, that you don't make an inadvertent rearwards movement of the cyclic. If there are no more questions, we'll go away and fly the exercise. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. The first student to fly the exercise will be Bob Horton. I gather this is called critical testing, Bob. Well, it is, to use the... Uh... The correct phrase, yes. Personally, I think it's bloody dangerous. Now, if you did this on a squadron, for instance, you'd end up being court-martialed, I reckon. Quite looking forward to it, really. <laughs> As uh, you'll probably remember from the classroom, uh, I was asking about the difficulties of closing the throttle and getting the lever down at the same time. Um, perhaps I could just show you here. Uh, basically, when you're flying along, you're in something like this position with your left hand controlling this lever here, which we call a collective, and your right hand here on the cyclic stick. Now, for the purposes of this exercise, we're simulating the engine failing by closing the throttle, which actually involves a movement, something like that, on the throttle lever, just like so, and at the same time, trying to lower lever. And in some of the situations, you can probably see that if you're flying along normally like so and try and do it, you end up trying to fly the aircraft with your hand kinked in, like so. So it could be slightly difficult, I don't know. I'll have to go and find out exactly what it's like. Mike Swales, like all the tutors, is himself an experienced test pilot. He is to supervise the test flight, which if done only slightly incorrectly, as the American one was, could write off the helicopter and endanger the lives of the crew. The Scout is an old design and has no automated controls. 
As it has to be flown manually all the time, it quickly reveals any ham-fisted piloting. But Bob Horton is a very experienced Navy pilot. Bob hasn't far to go, for the exercise is flown over the Boscombe Down airfield. OK. Get yourself nicely stabilised, make sure everything is clear below you. Yeah. And then on your own countdown, three, two, one. Now, I want you to close the throttle and lower the lever immediately, correct the yaw to the right, and to drop the nose nice and smoothly in order to regain 50 to 55 knots before bringing the nose back to a level attitude, ready for the engine off landing at the bottom. OK, Mike. Any questions? No, I'm happy with that, Mike. OK. I'm happy with that. Okay, hey, bring this to a virtual free air hover then. A lot of power, a lot of left boot in. And okay. three, two, one. Okay. And he's going right forward, air speed coming back, NR recovering very slowly. Back with the About 50 knots. And the critical moment. The only way now to cushion the landing is to use the energy stored in the freewheeling blades at precisely the right moment. A little bit more, that's it. and there we are. Bob Horton was asked about the exercise. Well, different, I can tell you. Uh, I'm still alive anyway, so it obviously went not too badly. <laughs> and uh, it was good fun, actually. Very enjoyable, and learnt a lot from it, actually. It's not over yet, for to complete the test, Bob will have to make some ten descents at differing heights and speeds to establish the scout's avoid curve. Coming up, 50 knots. Leveling, watching the NR, and holding her there. OK, run complete. For the fixed-wing students, the most testing exercise is still to come. The killer spinning. Next week, how to do it and how not to. <laughs>